Hey, Bridge Church, this is Pastor James here today. Um, excited to be able to answer another question for you all. These are questions from our Q&A that did not make it to the stage. Um, and so I am excited to hop right into this one. This particular question that came in, it said, why does God love killing children to punish parents? God killed the firstborn of Egyptians for enslaving the Israelites. Why not just punish the parents? I would love to start off by establishing that God does not love killing children to punish parents. I would also say that God does not love killing children. And lastly, I would say that God does not kill children. Now, the world that we currently live in, this is a direct cause an effect of our sin entering the world. And so we look at it and through free will, of course, given to us by God, bad things happen to us, I get it. Or we do harm to others or, or others do harm to us. Unfortunate things happen to us in our lives. And I guess the key word that I'm getting at and I'm trying to get to is the word suffering. Suffering is a direct consequence of sin. Now I'm gonna say that again, rewind. Suffering is a direct consequence of sin. And because of sin and the fall of man, God allows these things to happen because the fact of the matter is we now live in a broken world. So let's look into the meta narrative of the Bible. The meta narrative, this is simply the unfolding of the story of the Bible from beginning to end. And as we look into the meta narrative, um, we start back in Genesis and we're able to look at Adam and Eve. And God's intent for creation was simple. It was to live in harmony with us. It was to commune with us. It was to dwell among us. In the fall of man, it truly interrupted that. This, this fall, it interrupted God's original intent for creation. And because God is holy and God is righteous, sin must be atoned for. And so let's pause there for a moment and we'll, we'll pick back up there a little bit later. And so as we move on in Genesis, we see that God's creation, um, his purposes, he even moves forward with Abraham, even after we sin, even after we fell back in the, the original creation, God, he, he reestablishes that purpose. And so let's take a look at Genesis chapter 12. I'm going to read that to you. Um, and it says that now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and watch this. And I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we see that God continues here in this text um, with his creation purposes right through Abraham, he establishes a covenant that promises Abraham not only land and blessings, but it also establishes a covenant that says, I'm going to make you a father to many nations. And I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to curse those who curse you. And there's a cool parallel right there that goes even back to Adam and Eve, where God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. And now we see here in Genesis chapter 12, he's telling Abraham, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Father Abraham, many sons, many sons had father. I get it. You did not come here to listen to me sing. And so just to be clear again, God says, I will make you the father of many nations. And so God establishes the blessings and the promises that are bound together by, check this out, bound together by obedience. And so now in the context of the question, um, God killed the firstborns of Egyptians for enslaving the Israelites. Why not just punish the parents? Um, I want to get into that a little bit. And so we'll be going over into Exodus chapter seven, starting at verse 14. And to set this up a little bit, at this point, the children of Israel, which is the children that God establishes this covenant through Abraham, you know, I'm gonna bless those who bless you. I'm gonna curse those who curse you. These children, the children of Israel are now enslaved by the Egyptians. 
Um, and the Bible says that they had been enslaved by over 400 years. And we know that Moses is the leader that God has called to lead the children of Israel out of captivity. And so when we get here to, to chapter 7 of Exodus, God through Moses has instructed Pharaoh many times to let his children go. He, he specifically is asking Pharaoh to let the children go so that my children can worship me in the desert. And Pharaoh's pride and his stubbornness gets him to a point where now God begins to release these plagues. And I'm just going to start by reading this very first one. If we look at Exodus chapter 7, starting at verse 14, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile will stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And so if we skip up to verse 20, it says, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. He lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. So this is the very first plague that God sends to hit the Egyptians because Pharaoh is not letting his people go. And so from there, we see more plagues happen. Then God sends frogs um, that just completely takes over the land. Then from there, he commands for gnats to come from dust and to just swarm everything and flies and the plague of killing livestock and the boils on the skin and the hail to fall down um, from the skies and whoever's not safe or undercover, um, people and animals dying. And God sends the locusts and God sends darkness where he stops the sun for three days. And there's all of these plagues that are happening, but every single time in between these plagues taking place, there's dialogue. And the dialogue is simply God telling Moses, if Pharaoh does not let my people go, this is gonna be the next consequence. But at this time, Pharaoh's heart, it's already hardened and and it does not matter what's going on. He continues to be disobedient. And in that disobedience, the plagues, they continue to graduate. So what I find most fascinating is that for every single plague that God sent towards Egypt in result, in direct result of Pharaoh's disobedience, that there was a statement towards the lowercase g gods that the Egyptians worshipped. The Egyptians, they were known to worship multiple gods. And so when God even turns the water into blood and he turns the water of the Nile into blood, this was a direct statement towards the God of the Nile that the Egyptians would worship. And when he sent all the frogs from the seas, there was um, a God with the, with the head of a frog. And you just see it so on and so forth that every single plague that God would send as a result of Pharaoh's disobedience of letting the children of Israel go, it is the direct statement saying that I am God Almighty and I'm going to show you that by taking the very things that you worship and making it something that's a pain point in your life because of your disobedience. It's amazing to me. And so here we've established that God through Moses has given Pharaoh multiple warnings. He has been asking Pharaoh to let his children go. And now we've gotten to this 10th time. And here God says, Moses, let Pharaoh know if he does not let my people go, I will be killing the first offspring of all the people in the land of Egypt. And I bet you're wondering, the first nine plagues, they all have a direct parallel with lowercase g gods. What does killing the offspring or the first offspring of the Egyptian people have in connection to these lower case G gods. And what I would tell you is that Pharaoh was viewed in Egypt 
as the ultimate God to them. Over all the other gods that they worshipped or that they called upon, Pharaoh was looked at by the people of Egypt to be the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the, the one that's in the most control. And so it's almost like we're watching this movie build up to this climax where God the Father, the Almighty God, has made statements towards all of these lowercase g gods that we're seeing building up. And now we're at the end, and this is God's final warning to the people of to, to the people of Egypt and to Pharaoh. And God is now saying, if you don't let my people go, I'm going to attack you where it hurts the most. And I'm going to start with your direct first offspring, Pharaoh. And God sees it through. And so we're going to pick up here, um, reading from Exodus chapter 11, verses 4. And it says, so Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. And so as I read this, I understand that it's very easy to read the word firstborn and attach that directly to innocent children. Or to innocent babies but think about you yourself whether you are the middle child or you're the youngest child or you're the firstborn if we're looking in this context the firstborn of the Egyptians were actually the people who had the most power in Egypt the firstborns at this time they would have been the slave masters over the children of Israel they would have been the people that were um, following Pharaoh and doing what Pharaoh was saying to keep them in captivity and to keep God's children oppressed. Um, the firstborns would be the people with the most dominance, you know, and the most influence. And so for God to say that I will be killing the firstborn children of all the people of Egypt, he was taking out the people that had the most power and the most influence directly under Pharaoh. And as the Bible says, starting with Pharaoh's first child as well. And for the children of Israel, this creates an amazing moment where we see further covenant with God and his children. Because now we are able to see through the Bible the experience of the first Passover. Where in this same moment of God coming over Egypt and taking the firstborn ch children of the Egyptians, God gives instructions through Moses to his children that if they were to sacrifice a worthy lamb and that they would cover the fronts of their homes, the doors with the blood of the lamb, that God would pass over them and that their lives would not be taken and that the firstborn child of them would not be taken. It's an incredible moment that would be a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ and his shedding of the blood for our sins to cover us and to atone for the sins that we did, knowing that we are now in peace with God because Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross for our sins. So ultimately, in this story, in this story of God seeking for the children that he promised that he would bless those that blessed him and curse those who cursed him, he also uses this moment to establish time and time again that he is the one true God. He's not to be played with. God is not to be mocked. And God's not to be disobeyed. And I thank God for myself that as a born natural sinner, as someone who disobeys, as someone that falls, that just like the sacrificial lamb in Exodus, we have a sacrificial lamb in Jesus Christ. And that grace, that love, that life that he laid down for me, it gives me eternal life. And so lastly, I just want to wrap up by going back to this word suffering. This question that was delivered, it actually comes with a very universal thing that we hear often. And that is, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? What I would say again and remind you is that suffering is a direct result of our sin. We know that suffering is in our lives because we live in a broken world. But God the Almighty, God the Powerful... He is able to use our suffering. He's able to use our heartbreak. He's able to use our losses to be our peace, 
to be our stability, to comfort us, to be Jehovah Jireh, our provider, to be Jehovah Nisi, the one who goes before us, the one who reigns in victory, the one that fights our battles, Jehovah Shalom, our Prince of Peace. God will use your suffering, your heartbreak, your loss, not only just to draw him closer and to draw us closer to him, but for his ultimate glory. What I want to remind you today is that, yes, we do live in this imperfect world, but for those that are in Christ Jesus, there's a hope. And that hope is that no matter what pains you're going through on this side, on earth, no matter what frustrations, no matter what deficit, in heaven, all pain is gone. All sickness is gone. And we get to rejoice and we get to live with God the Almighty, with our Father. And God also uses the suffering as a test of faith. Child, do you have faith in God that he has your life in his hands? Do you have faith in God that all things work together for the good of those who are in Christ Jesus? God calls his children to live in dependence of him the same way that he called us to do so in Genesis. And as we established from the very beginning of this video, God's purpose and the purpose for creation was to live in communion, was to live amongst us and to dwell amongst us. And for those that are in Christ Jesus, you my brother, you my sister, that day will happen when God comes back and he reestablishes a new heaven and he reestablishes a new garden of Eden. I love you all. I thank you for your time. I hope this question helps even just a little bit, and God bless you.